Hey, I'm Jeffrey Aviles, licensed clinical social worker, high performance coach, and speaker. Um, and I also use hypnosis inside my process, which is extremely interesting and effective. Wait, you hypnotize people? Yeah, I hypnotize people. <laughs> is it is it the way it is like on TV when they do it, like the magicians and stuff, or is it different? It's it's a little similar. And what I do is I hypnotize people to break out of the trances they're in. So let's say, for instance, you're in, in a trance that you're overthinking things or you just aren't performing up to par. I hypnotize you so you dehypnotize yourself from being in that old unproductive trance and become in trance with a new state of mind. Oh, wow. Is that like a one session kind of thing or does somebody have to come back multiple times, get hypnotized? to kind of break out of the old habits that they have. That's interesting. For some people it's one session, but I like to work like within a four session framework, just in case I miss something the first couple of sessions. Yeah, that's cool. I did not know that. Wow. Um, I mean, I've seen, I've seen the videos you've been posting online and, and a lot of them are geared towards like the high performance stuff, which is what got my attention. Um, and just so I guess anybody who is watching, um, you worked with me briefly when you were in New Jersey as a therapist working with kids, and then you ended up moving down to Baltimore. Um, what was that? Three years ago, I think. Yeah, about three years ago. About three years ago. Um, and, and it always stood out the conversations we would have about starting another business. I know, I think we talked about maybe starting a halfway house when you first had moved there. Did you ever pursue that or was that yeah, um, I'm currently the director of a drug rehab, which as an entrepreneur, you wear lots of different hats. Very true. So that's one of the things I really don't talk about, but I, like that's something else I do on the side. Yeah, yeah, it's funny you mentioned that because I think people, when they hear entrepreneur, they have a lot of assumptions, but they don't really know what it means because it's not something that in school you're really taught to understand. I think they give you a general idea of corporate business in school but you rarely get a conversation from the entrepreneurial standpoint um, in your case, directing a halfway house in my case, owning my own uh, mental health staffing agency, you're constantly putting out fires. You know, it's never like you, you never know everything you're supposed to. Um, it's always a learning experience every day. There's something new that you have to learn and figure out. Um, so it's just an interesting conversation. No one ever really has that. Um, that open talk. It's a lonely road, I tell people, when you're an entrepreneur, because um, there's not that many people that understand the day to day of what you have to go through. Um, Absolutely. And I think one of the things that school missed out on, mind you, I went to graduate school. They never really give you a solid foundation on the most important elements of business, which is getting leads and closing them. Yeah. Well, like, I mean, that's a, that's a sales conversation. You know, sales, getting leads, referrals, closing business. I mean, most, you know, most professions won't go into that unless you go down the route of getting, going down the sales route or marketing maybe, or specifically going into some form of business. So it's a skill set that most people won't learn. And funny enough, I learned that skill in high school. Um, you know, I'll tell you, a lot of people don't know, but me and my brother, I, I want to say my sophomore year, we started selling CDs. We would burn CDs uh, with music and we would sell them, uh, you know, for $5 a piece or like three for 10 or something uh, to our friends. Just in high school, you know, we would tell them, hey, give me a list of songs. We'll download them and put them um, and we'll put them on a CD for you. And we got really creative. We would buy like those those glass cases. We would get like a label maker. Um, but that's a skill set that I ended up learning. I want to say just me and my brother kind of hustling really with no guidance or direction. We just saw that people wanted CDs, uh, wanted music. And at that time, CDs was, was the way you would um, listen to music for the most part. And I had to learn how to sell CDs to make some money. And we sold a, like, it wasn't like we sold 30 or $40 worth. I think, you know, you'd buy like the 50 pack or the hundred pack and we would sell the whole thing three or four times over. So we were, I mean, it was a lot of money and we would just reinvest the money and, and you know, buy dumb stuff with it, obviously. Um, but closing, like I said, it was a skill set. I think we started developing early and you're right. It's not something that as adults, I think is a conscious conversation. 
um, that a lot of people are having, unless they're forced into that situation. Like in your case, you're the director of a, of a, you know, a location of a rehab center. Like you have to know how to close and get leads and, and network properly. Um, and again, put out fires on a constant. And it's funny because, well, I did the same thing, but the CDs what, what didn't work. So what me and my brother started doing is um, I had a friend that uh, he had a, a connection for iPods. So I started to sell iPods. Wow. Which your credibility has to be through the roof. Of course. Everybody was, sex, was selling fake iPods and mine were legitimate. So they would buy it from me because of my reputation. And something else yep. we sold was BB guns. Which, BB guns. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> Yo. And they were just knocking on the door and my mother would come and go, why do you guys always have kids at the door? And she wouldn't know what we were doing. Of course. We had a side business with the BB guns. Well, when it comes to like the, the BB guns and the AirPods, like how did that work for you? Did you have to buy them first? Like, did you have to invest money? Like, what was the, the way it worked out for you guys? So we had to put money up front to buy them. And because we brought them in bulk, we got a discount. And we used our Christmas and birthday money to uh, fuel these other businesses. That's nuts. And how long did that go for? Was that like a one year kind of thing? Or did you kind of just do that for a few years until it ran out of steam? Yeah, we, we did it each for one year until it ran out of steam. What happened with the BB gun is uh, there was too much attention being brought to the house. And we're like, mommy's going to find out eventually. And let's <laughs> 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 well, just stop while we're ahead of the game. Yeah, you know, like, it's crazy because when I get a lot of questions about the start of phase of the business, kind of like that beginning time frame when people are wondering how much money does it take to start? How much time does it take? How do you get your clients? And one of the first things I try to ask someone before giving them any tips or any advice is, have you ever done anything when you were a kid to make money outside of a job? Raking leaves, selling random stuff, in your case, BB guns, in my case, CDs. Um, you know, have you had to do anything that requires some form of hustle? Because I feel like that lays down a huge foundation, um, especially when you're going into being an adult where you have a lot more to lose, a lot more at stake and you want to go into business. Um, so let's, let's talk about that for a couple of seconds. Let's talk about kind of that mentality of laying down a foundation when it comes to taking risk. Um, I think a lot of people's fear is that, like I'm taking a big risk by going into business. I know you work on the performance side. Is, is that where the hypnosis comes in? Or do you have other things that you talk to people about? Yeah, um, I talk about, uh, oh, like, like, a lot of the performance code stuff has to do with people overthinking simple processes. You get any athlete, uh, basketball player that's, that's now missing their three-point shot or football player that can't catch the ball, and what's happening is they're overthinking the process. You got to allow your subconscious mind to do what is taught you, what you've already conditioned it to do. And once you stop and take a break, for instance, if we were to fall, we would have to, uh, like, it happens automatically, but if we would have to think, okay, I got to shift my body, I got to close my, my eyes, I, I got to place my hand here, we overcomplicate the process and end up getting hurt. So a lot of the work I do is, is helping people stop overthinking and just allow the flow process to happen. Yeah, so, so just so I understand it, like overthinking, you're saying most people own roadblocks in place that don't even exist. Cause in, even in that case, when somebody's falling, you're right. They don't have to think about every step of the way before they hit the ground, their body just kind of goes in motion and, and protects itself subconsciously. Is that exactly the same steps when we want to take some kind of risk for starting a business or sell, selling something? Is it the same thing where we know what to do, but at the same time, we're, we're putting a lot of roadblocks in place. Absolutely, because what happens is you, of course, develop a business plan, right? Uh, step one, two, three. Right. But now you start think, overthinking step two, and you come up with all these hypothetical solutions of what may happen, right. and you never pull the trigger and take the actual risk. Now, it's not a guarantee that you're going to be successful if you follow through on step two, but right. you're only going to learn once you take that step. That's so true. You know... It's so true because 
even statistically, nine out of 10 businesses are going to fail. So like the other day I was telling my wife, I'm, I was talking to someone about helping them write a book and I have no idea about how to write a book. I'm actually a poor writer. I'm not great at articulating in the form of writing, but the person is, this, this young man is, is great at it. He just hasn't had anyone who believed that or giving him tips or advice on how to, I I guess, take that first step. So I was talking to him and I told him, look, why don't you write the book? He wants to write a kid's book. So essentially 20 pages or 25 pages, really short book with pictures. So it's not even that much uh, content in the book. Um, I told him, why don't you write 10 books um, fast? Like in the next six months, write 10 books. Nine out of 10 businesses fail. That means nine out of your 10 books are probably going to suck. But one of them will, and along the way, get better, learn, get better. And then eventually you're going to have one book that, that hits big. And my wife goes, why do you tell him that he's going to fail nine times? And I was like, because that's, rea- that's the reality of what's going to happen is you're not going to be a great writer in your first book. Um, but he does have some skill set that he feels he can apply. So I'm trying to push him through getting to 10 fast because eventually one is going to be good enough or he'll develop enough skill sets. He'll develop enough technique. He'll meet the right people along the way that can help him um, refine his technique. But you're absolutely right. If he doesn't start, it's all theory and you're going to constantly talk yourself out of it. Um, I mean, he hasn't started yet. This was maybe three, two or three weeks ago. So I'm not sure if I did a good job of convincing him or if I scared him because I told him he was going to fail, but that's how it works in my head. In my head, I'm just like, even for business, um, my goal is to, to grow to a second business, which we're working on a business plan right now and an SBA loan and stuff. Um, but it's the same approach Let's get to it fast. And a lot of small mistakes we're going to fix along the way, as long as we catch them right away and fix them. But if this next business doesn't work, I know I need to do three, four, five more to find the successful one. Cause maybe I don't have the right skill set for the business. I don't have the right techniques yet. Um, but you're absolutely right. Overthinking it is, is one of the reasons I haven't done a full podcast yet. Um, I did a few episodes, but we over, I mean, I overthink things like that so much because you're putting out content without that much context and it gets taken out of proportion and people start commenting and judging and, and even this that we're doing right now, I'm sure we're going to get some, some heat for some of the things we're saying, cause people don't really fully know us. Um, so, it, you know, everything you said just wraps around full circle. Um, you know yeah and 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 I like to take like like I love watching sports, and it's kind of like a numbers game with business um like a forty percent uh shooting percentage in basketball is great, right like in baseball three hundred percent batting average is great, oh, get you into the hall of fame yeah. get you, but in life, we expect it to be ninety percent, and it doesn't work that way that's true we're gonna fail more than we're successful, yeah. My son with baseball, I had to explain that to him because I think even kids um, at, a ki- at a young age, they start to think that same thing. They start to think 90%, right? Nine out of 10 times means you're good. But where does that stem from? Where do you think it comes? Where do we put that in our own minds? Um, that, that, that we have to be 90% good? Yeah, or why do, why do we feel like we have to succeed the first time at stuff? I think um, it's... Uh... You heard of the body's fight or flight response, right? Yep. I think we're so programmed to to fear pain that losing or rejection is a form of pain. So the immediate point that we get a taste of it, we run away. And our society is conditioned for instant gratification. So we're constantly looking to uh, get something to make us feel good. So when we challenge ourselves and do something that allows us to fail, we don't like it. So immediately we say, all right, this isn't for me. I'm giving up. Yeah. So a lot of your work is around that kind of breaking that habit. Yeah. Breaking that habit and letting people know, like it's as cliche as it is, it's all a mental game. Like I literally have helped people uh, forget traumas that they've been to therapy for years, get over decades of anxiety in just a session or even forget their name or a number. <laughs> what? Make, yeah, with the hypnosis, make them sway left or right. Wow. Yeah, uh, make them drop. Like it's lit, and, and and it's funny. It's nothing that I'm doing. Right. All it is is your internal voice. Wow. Like I'm getting, I'm getting my internal voice to become your internal voice, and your subconscious is accepting that suggestion. 
So if I could do something as powerful as that, I teach people how to do it themselves. Man, that's amazing. Well, let me ask you this. What about for kids? Do you, do you feel like that the need for failure or the need for instant gratification can be molded at a younger age? Or is that something that just adults can only kind of figure out when they're older? No, I think it can. And as weird as it sounds, I believe um, sometimes cartoons are a great way of motivating kids to build up that grit and growth mindset. Cartoons. Okay. Yeah. Interesting. Anyone in specific in particular? I mean, uh, you could look at the, the anime or even the Marvel ones, as long as it has a message of working hard and constantly training to improve yourself. That's a message that is going to really resonate with the child and they're going to grow up with that philosophy. Like there's tons of people that have been influenced as adults by these anime or cartoon characters from back in the 90s that they credit right. the mentality to that. Right. So conditioning can start at, at a young age. And, and, you know, it's something that I think consciously I'm trying to be more aware of. My son's nine now. So a lot of the things I talk to him about revolve around the mentality I've developed over the past years as a business owner, where um, I guess in school, you're taught that an A in a class means you're smart and a B means you're, you kind of know the material, a C, D, and F means you're not smart. And I know that's not the message they're trying to come across, especially in the education. I know teachers have the right intention and they don't want a kid to feel like they're not smart. Um, but that's what the grading system does do subconsciously. If you get a D, you come home and your parents want to know why you didn't get an A and the teacher tells you, oh, you can do better, um, which there's two reactions to that is the kid maybe walks away empowered going, all right, the teacher believes in me, my parents believe in me, I'm going to try harder. Or the kid walks away saying, I tried already so hard and I didn't do well, I guess I'm dumb. I guess I'm not smart. Um, and we really don't know what reaction you're going to get. But then as an adult, the grading system disappears. There is no A, B, C, D, or F. Um, and I guess F you can associate with failure, but even in business, there's no real failure. There's only giving up. So it's one of those things where, I mean, with my son constantly, I'm just like, when he's struggling in school, I'm like, don't worry about it. It's really not that important. Do your best and try to learn the material, whether you get an A or not. And if you didn't learn it and it's not something you're going to apply long term, who cares? It's not that big of a deal. Um, because I want him to, in his mind, understand that um, that failure is really temporary and it's not that serious. Failure is not as painful as, as most people would lead to, you know, lead to to think when they get older it's really like you said it's kind of just in your mind just these roadblocks that you're placing um you know so it's, it's a conversation i have at with a nine-year-old constantly <laughs> you know trying to make sure that that he doesn't put these his these boundaries that are almost they're not real they're they're fake to an extent um so yeah and that's and that's powerful and one of the things that i do with a lot of people i work with i try to look at the purpose behind what they're doing because me um uh high school i was not motivated like I, I pretty much had kind of system and i knew as long as i get a passing grade which was a c or d yeah I'm good. so all throughout high school i really wow. didn't try my mother would beat me up my dad would be like <laughs> <laughs> what's wrong with you are you gonna drop out and i was like i know what i'm talking about like i know what i'm doing like i got a cd went to community college right at the same grade level up and then went to a real college and that's when i really started trying and made the and, and made the beans list but it was wow. like it, i had a purpose like like i knew the long game right 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 i mean that's that's big one of the um i think one of the posts i had on facebook maybe a month ago was about that was um centered around understanding what success was um and how that's different for everyone so you you i guess at a young age in high school understood that success was maybe getting you know your bachelor's or your master's and you knew how to get there and it didn't require straight age from freshman year in high school it required for you to con the system like you just said as long as you can and then you you knew when to 
to turn things around. But that's a big, yeah, that's a question that I, I mean, I asked it on Facebook and, and had so many people respond with their own version of what success was. And the funny thing is every single response was correct. Success to each person is different, you know? Exactly. And, and the funny thing about the story is I was able to have that mindset because I failed early. So I knew the consequences of getting an F and was comfortable because mm. I saw the bigger picture. That's so true. Yeah. I mean, I tell people I can't, I'm failing every day. Like that's just, it's just, I don't perceive failure as a bad thing. It, the one thing I realize is, and maybe you can touch on it is when you fail, if you try to rectify it right away, it's easier to overcome as opposed to failing, letting that failure pile up with a second, a third and a fourth. And then you try to overcome all of it. And it's, it's extremely overwhelming. Exactly. And even be, or, or even being petrified of failing. And when you do fail, the whole thing blows up. Right. Or you freeze and do nothing. Yeah. I, have, I was just telling you, I have a call later with a friend of mine. We're going to do a video conference and we're going to brainstorm some ideas. Um, just like business ideas that we haven't attempted to do. But for someone who's sitting at home right now, you know, they're in quarantine they might be stressed out. They might have some anxiety. They might have that itch inside to try something new. So we're going to sit there. We're going to brainstorm some ideas that other people can attempt. And the one thing I really want to make sure people understand is, is that same conversation that there is really no failure. You have to go try in order to learn, um, to go find that, that success in business. Um, so I'm glad you're touching on that a lot. And, and, and that's something else that a lot of people neglect uh, the power of networking or even building other people up. Like one thing I love doing is I love finding people that I can motivate them to do something else because it may come back around and help me. Right. So you're doing these things with no immediate expectation of you're not asking for money. You're not looking to get paid. Their success might not directly impact you negatively or positively you're just doing it because you know you can help them and maybe down the road they there's some recognition you get for it yeah for instance um and i wanted to segue into this portion in a little bit but um yeah, talk somebody, to me. um uh, uh a friend of mine finished a marketing degree he got a bachelor's from a very respected university mm -hmm. he didn't know anything about marketing like he knew the theory and stuff, but he didn't know real world marketing. So me and him start talking and I, and, and I go, why don't you learn Facebook ads? Because, you know, that's where a lot of the money is now. So right. we start talking and then he gets scared about buying a course. And I go, listen, I'll buy the course for you. Just learn it. Like, I, I don't want you to throw away your marketing degree and not be able to, <laughs> to learn the Facebook course. And right. And he's been able to get money from that. But it wouldn't have happened unless we had that connection. Right. So you ended up covering the cost of the, of the course. He took the course and now he's applying it and actually making some money in return. Exactly. Buddy Leo. Leonel. Just oh, finished boy. calling. Yeah, he just, yeah, I'll call him back after. Um, yeah, what I was, don't even know what I was saying. Um, um, about the Facebook ads, the marketing. and oh, um, yeah. Yep. You were just talking about your, your friend. Um, you know, one of the things that, that I've tried to do myself is the same thing, a real selfless act of just giving away whatever I feel can help someone. Um, I haven't gotten to the extent of, of funding another person's ambitions yet um, or opportunity, but I feel like that's something that's lacking too, man. A lot of people have knowledge of, how someone else can accomplish something that the other person wants to like someone else is telling you, I want to accomplish this, but I'm afraid I don't know how. And there's people who know how to help them and they won't um, unless they're getting paid for it or unless they're getting something in return. Um, and that's tragic, you know, and that's one of the reasons I'm doing videos like this where I'm just having casual conversations with friends of mine that have knowledge and expertise in different areas. And I'm just posting them 
And I mean, I don't really have an end game with that right now, other than if this conversation right now can help someone perform at a higher level, overcome some fears, or maybe just ask some questions. You know, we might post this and get two or three people that ask questions about hypnosis or about how to overcome fears and things like that. And then you can engage with them and help them. Um, I feel like that's a huge win, um, you know, for everyone. Like you said, it, it comes back around eventually. Nobody knows when. I don't really need anything from this. Um, but the fact that you helped your friend, man, that's a true testament to, to the fact that there's good people out there that really want to help, you know? Yeah, and, and, and you know, and, and something else I wanted to talk about, a lot of people are home now and they may be unemployed or furloughed or whatever the case may be. There's yeah. still a bunch of skills out there that can still make you money. Like one thing is copywriting. Like I've yeah. seen, I've seen people pay $10,000 for a copywriter on one project. Yeah. Like a, a, another skill out there is mastering sales. Like I'm currently like investing money in mastering the sales process. Website development is another one, right? There's so much these of these other things that people can start learning on their own. Of course. To try to build money. Yeah. You know, w one of the things I, I think people can start with is like there, like you said, there's so many ways I think like in the big, I think you mentioned it before, what people really need to do is sit down and define what they're looking for, especially like you said, being furloughed, being in, even in a position where you're working from home, where you're not traveling 30 minutes back and forth to work. If you took that time, I think to understand yourself first, like really be self-aware of what you want out of the next couple of years of your life, there is opportunities to do what you love and make money doing it. I just don't think people have the time during the day to think about that. Um, you know, for example, when I mentioned the kid that want that I'm helping him write a book, he works as a social worker as well. And at the end of the day, he's exhausted. So I think by the end of the day, he's so mentally exhausted that for him to sit there and write a book, it is challenging. Um, and it's easy for an outside person to go, well, if it's your passion, you sh there's no reason why you shouldn't do it and kind of judge that person. And what I tried to really explain to him was, look, I'll, I'll take time out of my day if you want to talk one hour a week. That way, you know, you're not the only one setting time aside because you have to make a short term sacrifice. Just like you said, you're spending time and energy in learning the sales process. That's a sacrifice that you're taking time away from your kids, from your wife, from your from your work. That's giving you the immediate gratification of money. Um, and I feel a lot of people forget to, to understand, like you will have to make a short term sacrifice. So first, you really got to figure out why you're going to make that short term sacrifice. In your case, I, I guess you have figured that out. In my case, the same thing. I'm obviously, I'm spending time with you on a call um, to give value to others. And my son wants to play Fortnite and stuff like that. So I am taking time away from crushing it on the PS4 right now. <laughs> but, um, but yeah, self-awareness, I feel like is a huge first step for a lot of people, you know? And I think you hit the uh, uh, nail on the head exactly. Like it's certain activities, which I also teach them my clients uh there's something called uh the quantum focusing method that i teach and it's not an original idea like a bunch of people have taught it i just put my own spin but it's kind of like you have these c-level thinkers and all they're focused on is the problem and putting out fires if you see okay. this level of thinking just problem focus you're going to be drained at the end of the day right these level thinkers that are just confident with things staying the status quo you eventually mm -hmm. get bored and you only engage in activities that kind of feed you but don't have you feeling fulfilled and then right. there's a level things with things that motivate you and rejuvenate you a lot of life is about getting into this eight level of thinking where you're constantly taking on ch challenges that excite you that make you open up your eyes and go this is going to be tough but it's kind of exciting as opposed right. to boring and i really don't care yeah I mean, all three different levels, you know, there's people at each stage in life. Let's start with, with the C-level thinker. That's the busy bot, I guess, like you said, even at a job, they're focused on putting out fires and maybe they're not executing at the highest level. How do they get to that, to that second level of thinking where they go, okay, putting out fires is time consuming. There has to be maybe a more strategic way to do it. How do they get to that point where they're even realizing? Because they might, even, you know, most people I don't think know where they are in that in those three tiers you described. 
Well, uh, I have a journaling process that if anybody's interested, they could uh, comment, send me the journal, and I'll send it to them. But taking time to actually think and process what's going on. Because everybody's running okay. around like a chicken with his head cut off, and you're just yeah. reacting. Nobody's really processing and thinking, how can I make this process even easier? Like, um, as therapists, one of the biggest problems is uh, typing notes. Mm, There's an mm -hmm. easier process for doing this that doesn't involve you spending so much time or letting it pile up. So right. for that level of thinking, just taking a Sunday where you take two to three hours with your pen and pad, and you just write down like a hundred solutions to that one problem and see what your mind comes up with. So, so you're saying people need to take a step back and reflect a little bit um, in order. And that's, man, that's a big one because I have this conversation with my wife all the time. She always, you know, she's finished, she just finished up her MBA, um, her master's in business and marketing. Um, and that was one of the conversations she would always have. She always goes, you have, you have so much time to clarify what you want that you have like a clear idea of how to get it. In her case, she was pretty much just saying full-time job, going to do online courses and then spending time with the family. By the end of the night, she's so drained that really she was at the sea level where it was just putting out fires, executing what was in front of her that didn't allow her to really think ahead. Now that school is done, I see a big difference where there's a lot more clarity where she's able to clearly define um, some of the things she wants to accomplish. So I fully agree, you know, with everything you're saying, that's, that's one of the things that I think everyone is at a different stage. So when they hear a talk like this, somebody that's at an A level might not need to take a notepad out and write down a hundred solutions. Cause maybe they're already at a high level of execution. They're at a good place. They have time during the day where they allocate to, um, you know, maybe learning something new, maybe redefining, you know, some of the things that they don't like about themselves and, and maybe they have some form of a routine, you know, and is that something that you suggest creating a routine throughout the day or does that even help? I know there's a lot of those, like the billionaire routine, you know, wake up at 7 a.m. or at 6 a.m., do yoga, eat breakfast, read the newspaper. Like, do you have your clients do stuff like that? Yeah, and I practice what I preach. So I wake up at 4.30 to uh, go work out. In the morning? In the morning. Come on, man. You don't need to show off right now. <laughs> <laughs> go ahead. Continue. Go ahead. But what you want to do is you want to, uh, the brain is lazy. Our brain is extremely lazy. That's why Agreed. we're lazy. No, you're right. You're right, though. <laughs> so your brain tries to shortcut everything. Okay. If it, if it has to expend energy on doing something new or learning something, it hates it. It tries to go back to the old way. So, for instance, when you're trying to pick up a new habit, your brain sabotages you because it doesn't want to spend that energy. Because every time you're thinking, you're exerting energy. Okay. So, by creating a habit, you're making it easy for your brain to not to have to think. Because your brain hates it. Your brain loves to automatically program everything to set it and forget it. But if every day it's a new struggle, is a new routine you're creating, your brain is going to spend so much energy that by the end of the day, you're going to be wasted. You're going to be drained. Right. So the routine helps you eliminate the exhausting part of energy. And it, it kind of tricks your brain into thinking that it's easy because it's every day. It's the same routine. Exactly. Because you're not reinventing the wheel every day. Like that. I is see what you're saying. Energy. So what's, I mean, if anybody is listening at this point, what's something what's a routine that you think it's easy that people should pick up at least for their morning? I mean, you do the 4.30 AM. Let's assume most people are not going to get up at 4.30 like you. What's, what's kind of a, what do you think somebody said that it came maybe an hour before work to themselves or what would you suggest? Um, I would say dedicate a, a hour or a half an hour before you go to sleep to okay. plan your day. And then a half an hour in the morning to solidify that and to see if you are, if there's anything you missed or if there's anything that you want to add on and just to gain clarity on what you're going to do. So the night before 30 minutes planning your next day. Yeah. And then it's clarifying those plans and figuring out how to execute them. 
is something you're suggesting. And are you saying 30 minutes planning on after you're out of work that next six or seven hours after work, what you can accomplish or how are you structuring that? Whatever your goal is. So if your goal is to get better at your day job, planning it the night before, that way you're sleeping on it and you already have solutions that you're going to encounter. And then in the morning, going about it the same method that uh, you had those 30 minutes to clarify, to reflect, to see if you dream, dreamed and came up with anything different or if you could just add something bigger. Okay. I love it. I love it. Even, you know, that, that one piece of advice I think is hugely impactful um, to anybody. I mean, for myself, I don't have, even though I know exactly what you're talking about, I've read books that mention what you're talking about. I don't have a routine at night. Um, that's that concrete. Usually I'm, I mean, I'm working on projects late into the night. Um, but usually I pass out with the laptop on top of me, or I just pass out, you know, on the couch curled up into a ball. Um, and then I just wake up and I, I continue. So that's something, you know what, I'm going to work on, on creating some time to just clarify, um, a nice little routine to put that into action. Cause I know that, I know that has to work. Yeah. I was mentioning in the book, the book, the ultimate sales machine, because it, he covers Chet Holmes in the book covers, uh, I think his first or second chapter on something like that, like creating a routine, um, especially to be more efficient. So he says the same thing. People throughout the day are, are constantly doing things, but they're not necessarily doing things that are making them to be more efficient or um, what was the other way that he put it? Um, he put that people are pretty much working really hard, but they're not actually working smart. Start to tell everybody this is the type of person you are. Start to create that identity. Like whenever I uh, work with uh addicts or weight loss individuals i tell them listen brag about the fact that you're going to the gym if anybody asks you what you're doing i'm going to the gym tomorrow i'm going to the gym next week all i do is go to the gym so 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 start to brag about the new personality that you have and the next thing you do is you start visualizing it you keep getting the practices in and you start to identify your trigger moments when you're gonna uh, not have that habit or when you're not going to engage in that skill you visualize the challenges and you visualize them and you visualize yourself showing up with the correct behavior during these challenges. The, with the visualizing, just to clarify, you mean they, this is something that they're going to internalize throughout the entire day, right? This is not like they set a few minutes aside to visualize. This is just a constant thought process, right? It's a constant thought process. And, and what's happening is, um, and when I say visualize, there's, diff there's two different forms of visualizing. Like I just right. use visualize because it's easy to use those words. Sure. Imagining it and then there's the self-talk. So certain okay. people have poor imaginations and can't visualize it. Okay. Just talk, to, talk yourself through it like it's actually happening. And what's going on is a lot of individuals are, are having negative visualizations. So right. they're already picturing, picturing themselves um, failing. Right. So you want to recondition yourself and start seeing yourself being successful and you'll start to see how incredible your subconscious mind is and how it responds to those suggestions. There's, um, there's a lot of quotes that you'll hear with um, people saying, if you believe you can do it, you can. And if, believe you, if you believe you cannot do it, you cannot do it. Um, and, you know, you'll hear that a lot. And it sounds kind of cheesy sometimes when you hear quotes from, from books or from people, but it's absolutely true. Like, you know, even for, for the athlete, if an, if an athlete thinks that he cannot accomplish something, there's no way his body is going to contradict what his brain is thinking, you know, and the same thing happens in business. Like I'm looking to go into, into another business over the next six months. There's no way emotionally or physically I'm going to be able to do something if my, if I keep telling my brain that it's not possible. Um, so that's, uh, you know, the visualization, that's absolutely correct. A hundred percent. Um, hopefully people believe that. Cause again, you hear it and it sounds cheesy cause it's in these self-help books and yeah. a lot of people like to dismiss that. Um, or a lot of people talk to a successful person. And when the successful person says, I use visualization, I think people are looking for a shortcut. They're like, yeah, tell me the, tell me the real secret, but yeah. that is the real secret. You know, these are good tips, man. What's, what's one more? Let's get one more. I have to head out and get my kid. There's like a parade thing going on, but let's get one more. What else do you got? Um, I got tons, but, <laughs> but this, one, 
And I, like, I got tons of techniques. Uh, I'm very, like, I spent so much on stuff. I believe it. No, we're going to have to do this again because there's, I mean, this is not a one-time conversation. Um, and I, I, I don't want anyone to believe that in, in 30 minutes, um, especially when things are not in context to their life, that they're really going to be wowed or changed. I think it's a constant, um, depending on where people are in their life, they constantly have to come back and get refreshed until their mind does pick up the habit um, consistently. But just one more piece of give me something, anything. Come on. Sure, sure, sure. So let's say your goal is to make 100,000, right, in a year. Like you want to hit six figures, right? I'm down, yeah. You work backwards from that. All right. Uh, what do what does it take to make it in six months? What does it take to make it in a month? What does it take to make it in a week? What does it take to make it in a day? Now that you have that idea, ask yourself how many phone calls you got to make, how many clients you got to see, how many books do you have to read? What are all these small habits you need to take in order to develop that six figure mindset? Yes. So reverse engineer, start with the end result. And this is not just for the six figures. I guess anyone can apply this to anything. anything. Start at the end, right? Figure out what success is for you and then break it down backwards all the way till the daily. What do you have to do every day to get to that point? Exactly. I love it. Anyone can do that and they don't really need much help, right? You just sit down, pull out a notepad, pull out your phone and start detailing, you know, what that end result is. Um, exactly. So if you want to be the best personal trainer, look up what the, what the current personal trainers are doing or the best in the, in the industry, right. uh, adopt their habits and see how many times a day you got to emulate their habits to get to that point. Now, is there a time frame that you put on this reverse engineering process? Cause it's different for everyone as well. You might look at a personal trainer that in 12 months has risen to the top, but in reality it might take you longer because you might not be executing it exactly like that person or your circumstances might be different. So is putting a time frame to your goal a bad thing or is that a good idea? It depends on who you are as a person. If you're a person that's overcritical of yourself, then you shouldn't put a time limit. If you're a person that's e too easy going, you need to put a time limit. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I get it. Put a time limit because you just yeah, I'm too and easy. Also, going. you can always take the shortcut route of just paying somebody that's already been there to teach you how to do it. I love it. You to shortcut it. Yeah. You know, that's, I think for the next conversation, maybe we pick up on that on on people realizing that they should, if they want to speed the process up to success, find a mentor um, or pay somebody to, to be your trainer or your, you know, to be their leadership for you. Cause that's, that's a big step. I'll be honest for, for a lot of people, they don't, again, I don't think we're taught to find a mentor as adults. Um, I think we go, especially if you go into a job or you have a boss and just that boss employee relationship is never, I don't want to say it's never, it's rarely a mentor relationship where the boss really wants to give you all the knowledge because in reality, they're, they're going to be creating their competition. You know, if the boss has an employee that's that efficient, the boss's job could be in jeopardy. So we'll pick it up there at the next, I mean, let's maybe do something in a week or so. I'm going to work on, um, 